Hello, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I'm Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of Mountain Crown by Karen Lawachi. This is a book from Solaris Rebellion. It's a fantasy novella, novella. <laughs> it's coming out October 8th, 2024. I received this arc from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review. This book took me entirely by surprise. I requested it, I will admit, because it was a novella. <laughs> and sometimes I want a little novella to like slide in with the big books to kind of get another review in. Uh, yeah, I think about that kind of stuff. Also, it sounded cool, it sounded cool, but I was not expecting such a nuanced yet powerful discussion on colonialism and occupation. The book also provides a unique take on dragons and it was a quick and exciting read. It reminded me a little of The Unbroken and also somewhat of A Memory Called Empire. What's it about? Uh, Mecca must capture a dragon king or die trying. War between the island states of K Kataka and Mazemore has left no one unscathed. Mecca's nomadic people, the Beswan, were driven from their homeland by the Catacans. Those who remained were forced to live under the Catacan yoke to serve their greed for gold alongside the dragons with whom the Beswan share an emphatic connection. A decade later and under a fragile truce, Mecca returns home from her exile for an ancient necessary gathering of a king dragon of the Crown Mountains to, balance, to maintain balance in the wild country. But Mecca's act of compassion towards an imp imprisoned dragon and Lily, a catechan veteran of the war, soon draws the ire of the imperialistic authorities. They order the unwelcome addition of an enigmatic Baswan trader named Raka to accompany Mecca and Lily to the mountains. The journey is filled with dangers both within and without. As conflict threatens to reunite, the survival of the Baswan people, their dragons, and the land itself will depend on the decisions, defiant or compliant, that Mecca and her companions choose to make. But not even Mecca, kin to the great dragons of the north, can anticipate the depth of the consequences to her world. I am having trouble today. <laughs> I think because I'm trying to like read these made up words and it's making me mess up other words. I don't know. Uh, I devoured this novel. The prose is so engaging and that it was highly descriptive and moved at a great pace. It took the time to slow down and include lyrical, elegant language, often in descriptions of emotions or the landscape. That's kind of how I prefer my books to go. <laughs> if I have to pick like a writing style, I, I really liked it. The world building is incredibly rich for a novella. Not only do we have the concept of the occupation and why, but hints as to the outer setup of the world. It's no way, it's no, it's by no way implied this is a lone occupied land in this world are given. We also have the dragons, which are magical beings that the Baswan can link to telepathically, yet don't try to control. The dragons are somewhere between an animal and sentient and act a bit like horses and dogs. <laughs> the Baswan also have this ability to telepathically link with their fellow Baswans and are able to read their emotions and other things about them. These aspects of the world building tie into the story so nothing feels over explained or needlessly included. While I love novellas, <laughs> I wanted more of this story when it was done but in a good way. It didn't feel like I was missing something. I just kind of wanted the story to go on longer. I don't think we're meant to get more into the story in this volume, though, um, you know, because it's listed as book one. So obviously it's some kind of a series uh, because I also don't think it's something that can be wrapped up easily. One person can't end in a colonialist regime just as one person can't carry one out. In terms of the characters, I really liked how Mecca was not some girl on her first mission. She's mature, knows what she's doing, and is entirely confident in her abilities, yet she's not arrogant. While everyone seems enamored by these fierce, openly angry young women in books today, I mean, I get it, a woman who is fierce and angry yet keeps it contained and boiling under the surface is more interesting to me as a character because that sort of character is hard to convey in fiction. Her strength and resolve are shown in the things she doesn't do, the passive rigid resistance she espouses by her actions. She compiles when she complies when needed but isn't afraid to renege on promises made to someone she doesn't respect. She also has a light soft side that rounded her out. <laughs> she's not the most gregarious or, you know, she's not a flamboyant character, but she bears a weight that carries the story through. And I really, really liked her. I also really liked the other two characters, Lily and Raka. One is openly likable after the first bit and brings in a little bit of fun to the story. And Raka is mysterious and taciturn. 
The more we learn about these men, the more we grow to like them, despite their initial rough presentation. There's also a complex relationship that forms between the three of them, something I won't spoil, but which felt mature and natural, and I really liked it. The story itself is very simple. Becca is trying to bring a dragon back to her people to prevent fighting between males and to help populate the dragons in a different region. It's something her people have been doing for centuries, much like controlled burning, you know, in real life here, of forests that no longer happens. <laughs> there is a very, if you couldn't tell, there's a very subtle environmentalism thread running through this novel, as well as the direct attack on unjust war. The three characters together represent sides of colonialism we often see in the media. You know, the one, the colonized person fighting back. Two, the person from the colonizing force who has grown to appreciate the other culture and, in a sense, find more community with them than their own people. And three, the colonized person who is complicit or perhaps complacent in their own people's subjugation. As much as I just characterized the three characters, and that is how they appear kind of at the start, the novel broadens this and shows how these perspectives are actually very complex and can't be boiled down to simple designations. While the evidence of colonialism of indigenous peoples is apparent everywhere today, I think we sometimes forget that people were taking over others since the beginning of human history. Alexander the Great, the ancient Egyptians, the Roman Empire, and those are just the big ones. <laughs> These tensions and issues have existed for the extent of human history since the first group of humans decided they wanted the field the other person had. <laughs> This book reminds us that not only is colonialism and occupation of lands, whether by force or more subtle means, always destructive, people themselves aren't all bad. And making connections and understanding one another is how we can break these mentalities. And fighting back is important too. <laughs> Now that little rant being said, that's just what I got out of the story. <laughs> you can go into this thing reading it entirely at face value and find it entirely entertaining. But I would argue this book carries with it a deeper purpose that is poignant and relevant to today. If you couldn't tell, I thought this book was, a word I say all the time, absolutely fantastic. I, I loved it. I really hope that I'll be approved for the uh, the sequels, and I'm definitely going to buy this novella in paperback to add to my favorite shelf. So thank you so much to the publisher and to NetCali for this e-arc. Uh, I loved it. <laughs>